it's an honor and a pleasure for me today to introduce a dear friend of mine, Brick Sorber. Who is Brick Sorber? Who is Brick Sorber? Who is Brick Sorber? Who is Brick Sorber? Well, he's one of the original two men that started two men and a truck. That pair started in the, the business in the early 80s to earn spending money. And they used the 1966 pickup truck and placed an ad in a local shopping guide. It included a stick figure logo designed by their mother, Mary Ellen. And that logo remains the international corporate logo today. So usually the way I introduce our CEO is I always ask a few questions and they have to give me a very brief answer. So where are you born? In Lansing, Michigan. What is the last book that you read? Max Lucado's God Story, Your Story. Words that describe you. Funny, dependable, hair trigger. Favorite technological gadget, get ready. Sonic toothbrush. Seriously, don't knock it. <laughs> Favorite place where you like to be? Anywhere near Michigan's Great Lakes. Favorite hobbies? Marathon running, working out, and cutting and splitting firewood. Favorite food? Here is disappointing, but I have to see it. Mexican. <laughs> Italian. <laughs> My hidden talent. Brie, what is your hidden talent? Using really bad analogies to make a point. God bless you. And last but not least, how do you want to be remembered? And this is what he said, and I quote, as a follower of Jesus Christ and a man of integrity. End of quote. While I ask you to silence your cell phones, please, let's welcome my dear friend, Rick Sorber. I asked Mario, I said, um, I'm a very nervous public speaker. You have a podium that I can hide behind. He went, oh, yeah, no problem. This <laughs> is like wearing the cellophane to the beach. You know, it just doesn't get it done. Uh, Dr. Ensler, thank you. I'm honored to be here this evening. Uh, Two Men in a Truck is a relatively new company here in D.C. Can you just raise your hand if you've seen our trucks or even know about our, my company? Okay, good, because it, it's a pain to talk when people don't know who you are. Um, so I appreciate that. I'm kind of in between glasses and not, so I'm going to be going in and out here. Uh, just a little background about who we are. Uh, we are the largest moving franchise company in the world. We currently have over 8,000 employees, and in the middle of the summer we'll have uh, 10,000. We run over 3,000 trucks, working in 347 locations in the United States. 29 locations in Canada and one location in Ireland. Do you know why we're in Ireland? They got really good beer in Ireland. <laughs> and the people there are really funny too. Uh, it's a great place to visit. It's kind of really, it's our step into Europe. Um, it has not made a lot of money, but it sure has been a lot of fun. Anyway, we'll hope that it pays out later. Uh, we have a uh, front track to do 650,000 moves this year alone. It's about two and a half moves every minute of every hour of every day. We'll have move revenue of about $580 million uh, this year, and since inception, since we franchised in 1989, we've completed over 7 million moves. So with all that said, I'm probably not what you expected. You were prob probably one of the original two men, you were expecting some big burly guy with tattoos. Um, you did me this evening, so sorry about that. Uh, when we first started moving, people would say, we hired two men in a truck, not two boys. 
and my brother and I got that a lot. Now I travel around the country and I visit the franchises and I talk with the frontline movers, drivers, and customer service reps, and they look at me and they go, wow, are you little? And it's like, wow, are you old? It's like, dudes, I was moving furniture before you walked this earth. Right? I've been around a long time, so cut me a little bit of slack. You know, I'm also not a public speaker like uh, Dr. Ensler over here, okay? You will see me holding on to these notes like a drowning rat to a life rat, all right? So I am not a public speaker. Um, and finally, I'm not a polished Christian, only diving into my Catholic faith about 20 years ago. I've also not taken one business class in college. Um, I'm a geography major, makes a lot of sense, right? So there you have it. You got a small old man in stature, you got a poor public speaker, you got an average to below average Catholic up here with no college degree in business. And I am this year's first speaker for the CEO lecture series. I'm sure your speakers are going to get better as the year goes on. <laughs> but with that, here we go. It's important that I share my faith walk with you. Uh, quite honestly, some of it is kind of embarrassing and humiliating, uh, but I feel it's important to show where I was and how my newfound relationship with Christ affected two men in the truck. <clears throat> Let me give you a background about myself. I was born into a blue collar family in, Lan in Lansing, Michigan, and my family lacked God. And this was a good family. I watched my mom and dad work hard and raise our family into the upper middle class before they divorced when I was in high school. But I could count on one hand the amount of times that we went to church. This is not a knock on my family, it's just the way it was. Uh, my mom did teach us the Our Father prayer before we went to bed when we were small. And uh, our prayer before dinner was on a wooden plaque that hung above our kitchen table. It said, good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat. <laughs> Seriously, uh, that was it. And that, uh, God and faith were very foreign to me. As I became older, I formulated my own thoughts about God, Jesus, and the church. I felt Christians were weak. Life is hard, and people need a crutch. As a non-Christian studying a picture of Jesus gently petting a lamb, I thought, what a nice Jesus, he likes animals. For a picture of Jesus with a chill, laughing children on his lap, I thought, well, that's nice. He likes kids, too. I found out later these pictures have a lot of significant meaning. But to me back then, a guy that was born 2,000 years ago, could he really deal with the issues that we deal with today? I didn't think so. God, Jesus, and the church represent a process for weak people to follow to get them through life. But I was not an atheist. I did believe there was a God out there, a God who appreciated hard work, a God who rained hellfire on bad people, a God I needed to prove my worth to. If there was a heaven, God would take me because I worked hard, I was nice to people, and most people liked me. I felt compared to the rest of the world, I was a five-star recruit. If there was heaven, I was going. Two Men in a Truck started with a 66 Ford pickup truck uh, that my family bought from Michigan State University. It was an old agricultural truck with a standard three-on-the-tree transmission. Raise your hand if you even know what three on the tree is. Look at all the old people do. Huh? It's actually, you're shifting up on the column. This tells me how young my audience is. I could be in trouble here. Um, anyway, uh, my younger brother, John, and I, we would uh, haul, brush, and just jump to the dump. We called ourselves Men at Work Movers. And our first ad read something like this. Men at Work Movers, two men in a truck, 25 bucks an hour. And later that summer, we started using an old 15-foot uh, step van that my, my mom had. She would take it to estate auctions and buy furniture, take them back to a store and, and resell them. And she said, if I'm not using the truck, which was never, she said, you can use that for moving. John and I started using the 15-foot step van and we started actually moving um, small apartments and homes and uh, you know, use furniture delivery, that type of thing. We would put $3 from every move into a candy dish, and that was our advertising fund. And that candy dish still sits on my desk today. 
This year alone, our national ad fund, just our national ad fund alone is over four and a half million dollars. So the candy dish got a little bit bigger. <laughs> um, so what we would do is, uh, as a joke, my mom, she drew a cartoon truck with two stick men on a napkin and she taped it to the, uh, to the dish, kind of as a, as a joke rep representing myself and my brother. This is the same logo as the doctor had mentioned that we use uh, to this day. She also suggested we drop the, our name Men at Work Movers and call ourselves what we are, Two Men in a Truck. So the first thing I want you to know, if you get one thing from me, all of this, think of this, and write it down. Listen to your mom, because she could make you some serious cash, okay? That was a pretty good idea. So John and I, uh, John and I were shocked and thrilled uh, when people, I was, we were shocked that people are so thrilled that we just show up to do moves. And they do backflips when we finished, just doing, coming there and doing the work that we were doing. We knew we were onto something. And the amount of referrals that were coming in from, our, from the work that we were doing was incredible. The business was really starting to take off. We were really hardworking young guys, but we did have our issues. You have to remember, we were young. I'm gonna explain one of those issues that we had. We had a job at about one o'clock one day, and John and I both dropped everything that we were doing, met at the truck, and drove all the way out to this job. It was a long ways away. Knock on the door, and this guy answers the door, and it looks like he just woke up. And I said, uh, your movers are here. And he goes, I'm not moving today. I said, really, did you ever consider calling us and letting us know? And he went, nope. And he literally slammed the door in our face. And my younger brother just looked at me, and he goes, I go, let's go. So we get in the truck, and I pull this truck into this guy's front yard. I gas the engine and drop the clutch, and we were throwing more sod than you'd see in a sod farm. It was the holy grail of lawn jobs. Looking back, it was awesome, man. <laughs> so anyhow, Needless to say, our business, mostly my brother John and myself, needed some more refinement before we came up with our core values and mission statement. <laughs> As summer, summer ended, John and I packed it up for college, uh, and once we started school, my mom called. She said the phone was blowing up for two minutes, Rob. That uh, so many people were calling. She asked if she could hire a couple guys to keep it going. We thought, that's a great idea. We can come back for Christmas break, come back for summer, and the business would be up and going. It would be a few years later, my mom, Mary Ellen, would franchise the business. It was at Northern Michigan University um, that I went to school. That's up in Michigan's Upper Peninsula on Lake Superior. I met the love of my, my life, my wife, Fran. Uh, we've been married 32 years. Uh, Fran is number 12 out of 14 kids. And Fran came from a strong Catholic family. And as Fran and I dated, she began questioning the way I lived my life. I was on Northern Michigan's rugby team. Do we have any rugby players here by chance? Oh yeah, okay. I was kind of hoping the Catholic school wouldn't, but anyway. <laughs> um, we loved to party. The beer that we would drink and the songs that we would sing were not good, okay? <laughs> and my wife would not hesitate to tell me that they were not good. Uh, these conversations usually ended in arguments. However, she was making a point and I did start to question some of my actions. I began on occasion going to church with Fran, and I immediately started noticing people that were also going to church. There were some of my, my rugby players, my rugby buddies, who were also going to Mass. So that started to dispel that notion that only the weak people went to church. Fran and I hit the road running in the winter of our senior year, and we got married, we moved into married housing. By the beginning of May, we both graduated, and Fran was pregnant for our first baby. I used to say, we were pregnant with our first baby. It just sounds so bush league, doesn't it? My wife was pregnant, I wasn't, I was pregnant. <laughs> you guys are old enough, you get it. We bought an old station wagon to move back to Okemos, Michigan, my hometown. And my brother John was helping me to load the station wagon up, and I told John, I said, you know, it's weird, I've got no job, I've got no insurance, I have no permanent place to live, I have a degree that I will never use, I've got a baby coming, and I'm not worried. You know, I tell people that story and they go, wow, you do have a lot of faith. It's like, oh, no, I'm, I was really stupid and young. I had no clue what was facing me. 
And uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty scary time. Um, Fran and I jumped into life, and not long later, this will happen to you guys, you know, your, your age right now, 10 years will fly by. And I mean that, because it did for us. Our first 10 years that we were married flew by. We had two more kids, and it was just a blur. At the time, I didn't think so, but now looking back, my faith walk was very stagnant in those 10 years. During that time, I began going to church on and off, but I had a family to feed. My mantra was, if it's going to be, it's up to me, and God helps those who help themselves. It sounds very biblical, but it's not. You won't find those anywhere. You know, I thought, I, I did feel that working hard and taking care of my little family, that I would fall into God's favor. After all, he loves Fran, and I am taking care of her and our kids. I was starting to talk with God, but not in a deep way. More like how you would talk to a pair of dice before you throw them. <laughs> kind of like making deals with God. Oh, God, if you help me do this, I swear I'll do that. As we made more money, we began to tithe more and supporting some more nonprofits. I figured that was the Christian program. Be a good citizen. Be kind, be nice, and in turn, you are rewarded. It was a game I could play. I also felt the more money that you made, the more freedom that you had. If I were reading the Bible at this time, I may have noticed the amount of times money is mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned over 800 times. It makes over 2,000 financial references. The Bible mentions the word love only 310 times. Is it because money and financial matters are more important than love? I doubt it. I think it mentions money and finances because of the hell it can bring into our lives when we chase it. And I was clueless about real faith, and little did I know I was about to get rocked. I did keep working hard. I managed a beer distributorship for a couple of years, and I was an insurance agent for seven years after that. And like I said, I pounded those jobs. I worked hard. And, but I kept looking over at my shoulder at two men in the truck. My mother had franchised the business, and my sister, Melanie, was the first franchisee of Two Men in a Truck, and she moved down to Atlanta, Georgia to start it. My brother, John, a couple years later, started one in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Fran and I started our own franchise, a teeny one in Marquette, Michigan, a really small market. I would work on the trucks in the day and market the franchises at night. At this time, Fran began teaching accounting at the high school full-time with benefits, and would be home during the summer with the kids. And the risk and the hard work paid off and things were really looking up for the Sorbers. During this time, I was going to church with the family on a regular basis and began to pray for our general needs. And I felt, you know what, God was happy with me because things were good. After marketing the franchise and running our moving company for six years, my mom and my sister asked if I'd move back home to the corporate office. This would be a difficult decision, but Fran and I decided to do it. It was a huge risk. The company wasn't that big. We sold our little house, our business, and headed back to Okemos, Michigan, where two men in a truck all began. And I'm gonna tell you what, I really felt that I made it. We bought a brick ranch house in a nice neighborhood. We had a big yard with an in-ground swimming pool. Man, I felt I made it. We were no longer living hand to mouth. I started asking myself, how does someone act and dress when they are a success? And I had a picture in my mind of what success was. And this is embarrassing, but I want to share it with you. I went out and I leased a new Audi A4, because I thought, German sports car, that is sophisticated. I went out and I bought a Frank Sinatra CD to play in it. <laughs> Summer wind, comes blow it in, come on. From across the city. You know. <laughs> in my mind, successful men drank scotch. I went out and bought a bottle of Johnny Walker Black. I thought about joining a country club where I could rub elbows with other rich guys and tell war stories about our business. I had validation stamped on my forehead. I was making more money than most of my friends. Our kids were doing great in their new school and in sports. And my relationship with Fran, Fran, my wife, was really good. The influx of money was such a relief from having to stretch a dollar for so long. It just helped us to chill out. I worked in a place where I had ownership and I called many of the shots. 
I really felt that I had arrived. One evening I was home alone and I just mowed the lawn and cleaned the pool and it was time to have that cigar and that first scotch on the rocks poolside. I had one hit of that scotch and I almost puked. <laughs> When I was in Mobile, Alabama, I was talking in front of 1,800 people, and I said, who drinks scotch out there? Nobody raised their hand. Out of 1,800 adults, I went, there's liars at a prayer breakfast. How pathetic is that? And they all laughed, and pretty soon all the hands started going up, you know, but uh, no, it was bad. Um, I remember throwing it in the grass, wondering, man, is that gonna burn my lawn out? Um, I figured, you know what? I'll drink pink squirrels, I don't care, I'll figure out something. I did finish my cigar, and I really thought, you know, it's gonna take a while to fit my new lifestyle. But looking back, I feel that people come to Christ for many reasons. In many cases, when people hit bottom and have nowhere else to turn, they will find Jesus. I am not one of those people. Call it low self-esteem, but back then when things went bad, I would just blame myself, and I would try and work harder to fix things. It's, it's as if God turned my come to Jesus moment inside out. Not taking, every, he's not taking away everything, but giving me everything that I asked for. The very next day, my mood turned somber and my body felt hollow. I became very irritable and tired. Depression was setting in. To make matters even more strange, everything in my life was so good. Our franchisees, we only had 40 at the time, they were setting records monthly. We were adding new franchises monthly, several of them. Two Men in a Truck was featured on the Oprah Winfrey show. I had friends calling me up going, you're on Oprah Winfrey. My dad calls me up all excited, Brig, you're on the Oprah Winfrey show. I went, Dad, why are you watching Oprah at two o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> I still think that's funny. My picture, he was right, my picture was on national TV along with the rest of my family. My kids continued to excel in their new school and they were making new friends. And Fran was really happy with all the changes in her life and all the positive things going on. And she asked, why are you not happy? I, had, I didn't have a clue, it made absolutely no sense. How could you have everything you've always wanted and not be happy? It flew against everything that I worked for. I went to see a doctor and got a complete physical. The doctor found me in perfect health for a little short old guy. Um, of course, I was younger then. He felt I was depressed and he simply wrote me a prescription for depression and gave it to me. Depression is a very serious thing and I'm not making light of it. But I kept that prescription in my wallet for, for days because I went, no, the pill is gonna only mask this. I have never been depressed, why now? So, I just had to get to the bottom of it. Fran thought I should start to work out again, and I agreed. And I sat on my work, workout bench to start lifting, and I just started crying in my hands. And I'm not talking about man pouting. I'm talking about crying. I cried and asked God, why was this happening? Every time I prayed, you've given me more than what I've asked for. And now I just wish a bus would hit me. The next day, I dragged myself to work. And uh, that same morning, there was an article on the internet about the Left Behind series of books. Has anybody ever heard of those? Tim LaHaye, Left Behind? A couple of you? Okay, well, I'll tell you what it's about. The series is about what it would look like if Jesus came back to, in this world in our lifetime and took all the Christians to heaven and left behind all the non-Christians. That caught my attention. I go to church. Fran and I donate money to a multitude of needy charities. I would not be left behind, would I? You know, and there it was again, this question, am I good enough? Comparing myself to others, this constant need for validation. I did, I bought the first book and I was hooked on those things. But the book referred to the Bible a lot and it actually got me to open up the Bible. And my house was so, was total chaos with three kids, three little kids in the morning. So what I would do is I would read that Left Behind series at night and I started coming to the office a half hour early to read the Bible. And I would pray for the first 10 minutes, and I would just pray and ask God, can you help me make sense of this? I mean, where do you start? And that's what I did. 
and about prayer, Matthew 21, 22 says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. We must be very careful here that we don't put God in a sleigh with eight tiny reindeer. He's not a cosmic bellhop. We must be very careful about that. And I believe there's more to this reading. Just as Jesus prayed over five loaves of bread and two fish to feed 5,000 men in Mark 6, we must also bring what little we have and ask God in prayer through his power to make it sufficient. Max Lucado said it best when he said, God's sovereignty does not negate our responsibility. In other words, don't come empty-handed. Have faith he will multiply what we have offered him to accomplish his will. Examples of this. For me, it was patience and understanding with my kids. And for you, it might be a stronger, more meaningful relationship, maybe with your parents, brothers, sisters. The power to kick a bad habit. A rededicated attitude with your studies. Or maybe it's a new career direction altogether. Looking back, these initial prayers were answered for me. I became very curious about spiritual things. I was asked about starting a Bible study at work with some of the Christian employees I was talking with. I talked it over with our family, and we came to the conclusion, we're a privately held business. We can do whatever we want to do. It is really cool having a privately held business, by the way. You can write that down. And we eventually hired a corporate chaplain, and he ran the Bible, uh, the Bible study for us. I did not see it at the time, but God was answering those prayers by dropping resources into my lap daily. Christian people connecting the France Catholic faith, a whole side that I totally took for granted. Books, but most importantly, the Bible. It became apparent what I was missing, a true relationship with Jesus Christ. I had to give myself completely to him. No more trying to be good enough, no more comparing myself to others, and no more seeking validation. Seriously, who can gain acceptance from a perfect God when we are so imperfect? Romans 4, 5 says, people cannot do any work that will make them right with God. That puckered me up the first time I heard it. As I thought about it, it gave me relief that we cannot do any work that will make us right with God. I sat back down on my workbench and I prayed to Jesus to come into my life. I was not sure what that all meant, but wanted Jesus to know I was reaching out to him. I prayed that he'd have patience with me. And I use this line to the T, Jesus, I am not the sharpest tool in your spiritual shed. So this prayer is just between you and me. I felt so unworthy of his grace, of having to earn everything he gave me, including the daunting task of always trying to earn his love and validation. After this prayer, all my earlier perceptions began to crumble. And not overnight, but over a long period of time. Being a non-Christian to becoming a Christian, my experience has shown me that there is no instant gratification in becoming a Christian. There's no Tinkerbell or pixie dust that makes our lives instantly better. I feel we lose so many people from accepting Christ because they don't feel different right away. Jesus gives us a clue in, in his parable of the farmer scattering seeds in Mark 13. This parable explains in detail why so many of the farmer's seeds fail to grow because of the poor makeup of the soils in which the seeds land. Drawing a direct, direct parallel to God's word in, on the hearts of man. Only when these seeds land on fertile soil and are taken care of will they grow. Reading the Bible, praying, being mentored will allow your seed to grow. I would call that a delayed gratification instead of instant. With all that thought, I worked my soil by praying for more understanding of all the changes I could feel and the resources he was giving me. And this is key to what I'm telling you right now. I finally started to believe that I belonged to Jesus Christ. I finally started to believe. I was on, he was like on, we were, I was on the inside working with him and not looking at this whole religious thing from a distance. It was, it was a huge difference to me. I knew at that point what it was like to have Christ in my life and what it was like not to. I will never go back to the way I was, ever. And through it all, I prayed for wisdom. How do I use this knowledge in my personal life and in my business? 
in discernment. Speak to me, Lord, about the issues of right and wrong when it comes to my personal life and my business. In James 1, 5, 8, he says, If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him. He will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking. But when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to answer. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should, n- should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. They can't make up their minds. They waver back and forth in everything that they, that they do. What I'm saying is be specific in this prayer. Keep your eyes peeled and your ears open. For me, answers came very quietly and from the strangest places. In a few cases, from the mouth of an atheist at work. God has a great sense of humor, by the way. I can speak for two hours alone on how this prayer of wisdom and discernment radically changed my business and my family. When we become Christians, we receive the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.26 states, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress, for we don't even know what we should pray for nor how we should pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. That is crazy to me. We are so broken that we don't even know what to pray for. That God gives us the Holy Spirit to pray for us because we're unable to do it right. That just blows me away. And so, if it's true about our personal life, why wouldn't we do that about our business? Why wouldn't we do that about our schooling? You know what it proved to me? That this, is, this does not sound like it comes from a God that we have to prove ourselves to. Not if he's given us that much. Through all these uh, resources God put in front of me, I learned that Christ comes from all kinds of people and situations, good and bad. I learned we were born as sin- sinners in a sinful world. We just didn't become sinners. We were born that way. We were born with three strikes against us. Imagine walking to the plate, and before you get into the batter's box, the ump just screams that you're out. Most important thing I learned was that Christ's death on the cross was the ultimate validation for my existence, and here I was trying to get acceptance and validation as a sinner in a sinful world. I deserve God's anger, punishment, and judgment. He instead punished his son, Jesus Christ, in order to adopt me as a loved son. It was something I could never earn, and none of you can either. He just did it all for me. He's doing it all for you. It was the ultimate gift from a loving God. Through this gift, I made the courage to start a trusting relationship with Christ. This newfound faith gave me courage and strength to not only make changes in my life, but also in two men in a truck. And through several changes on the corporate side and the franchise side, we doubled our business in the last four years. We brought up customer service to just under 97%. That's pretty good for a moving company, doing 650,000 moves in one year. We are in in the midst of our 105th month of consecutive month-over-month growth since the middle of the recession. I came across a quote that hangs over my desk. It reads, a ship in port is safe, but that is not what ships were built for. I have come to the conclusion that businesses don't thrive and grow in port, but rather in deep blue water where risk and danger lurk. That is where you find adventure and riches. You will find all that there. And isn't that true about our faith? I came up with my own quote, faith in church is safe, but that is not why faith was given to us. A ship in port or faith under a church's roof has its purpose to get supplies, and to get out in deep blue water. As successful business people, we need both of those. I was hit with an epiphany like a sack of hammers a few years ago. God showed himself to me through this business. My relationship with God has transformed my relationship with my business. I started out in business as a businessman who was not a Christian. What did that look like? I had a scarcity mentality. Limited resources, which led me to hoard money, power, fame, and popularity. When your business is getting bigger, everybody wants to talk to you. The adventure and the excitement of business I kept to myself. I would put myself first. 
I measured my self-worth to the successes and failures of the business and stress who or what was going to take this away from me. And when something good happens, then something bad is always around the corner. When we limit God's grace and what he gives us, that's, what we start, that's how we think. I soon became a businessman who claims to be a Christian. This is a place where we put God behind us and we lean more on our business knowledge. And what I found is most business people find themselves in this middle area. They will acknowledge God in their business. They'll pray over the needs of the business. They'll still put themselves first, but they will take care of the people that take care of them. And then finally, I came to a place where the Lord wants me. My identity has evolved into I am a Christian who happens to be a businessman. I have a thankful, grateful attitude no matter what happens. Something bad happens, that's a sign that I need to look at that. I need to make changes. That's a good thing. I've got an abundance attitude. God's blessings are endless. Give to others likewise. Having faith, God will always replenish what you have, what you need. At Two Minute Truck, we share the money. We pay well, our corporate office, and we bonus when the company profits are up. Our employees have hopes and dreams too. Our employees are also God's children. Share the power. When, when employees have been around and proven themselves, give them all the ability to make meaningful decisions that can affect the company. Allow them to be wrong and learn from their mistakes. Allow your employees to be the face of the company. During annual meetings, we get uh, interviewed, national magazines, TV shows, all those things. We spread those out to everybody. Everybody should feel the adventure and the excitement of that. God has made us in his image. He made us adventurous. Be adventurous and share the adventure with your employees. And also realizing the endless grace and mercy our Heavenly Father gives me, I have the ability to give these out as well. Most colleges across the country won't even mention faith or, bring, or, or have you bring it into the office. How foolish that is. How about if we turn things up on its head? What if we put the bottom line last and our goal is to make sure that everyone that touched your brand won? that there was no loser. If customers are happy, they will use you again and they will tell others about you. Two men in a truck, every customer that we have, this year will have a range of 650,000, will get an email from us or a reply card asking how we did in many different ways. It is really expensive to do that. We also find out that some of our customers aren't very happy. So then we have to turn around and maybe fix something that is more expense, but we put that ahead of the bottom line. How about the, our, front, uh, the, our front line staff, our movers, drivers, our CSRs? We spend big bucks to get them trained. We have over 500 online classes that they can take. We allow them to get certified. 68% of management of two men in a truck franchises system-wide, these are people that started out on the trucks as movers, drivers, or customer service reps answering the phones. 42% of our franchisees started out on the trucks or on the phones. Several of them are millionaires now, multi-unit franchisees, and many of those don't have a college education. Home office employees, advancement's very important to people we have at our corporate office. We have 200 there. Our president, Randy Shaka, 39 years old, started out as an intern in marketing. 16 years ago. He got his degree at Michigan State um, as an engineer. We've got our HR director walked in our office 16 years ago. We hired her to file. She is now one of my four executives. She runs all of our HR at our corporate office and helps all the franchises. Not only did she work hard, she took many classes and we supported her and paid for all those classes. You know, I have hired outside executives in the past, blue chip ones, and they come in and 
they see places to cut costs. That is what they were taught in school. They watch the bottom line. And I tell you, those things are really important because you can have a lot of fluff and go out of business. Those are important. But another thing they do is they continue to cut costs. If they don't understand the culture of the company, if they don't understand about really the biblical principles of businesses, they will burn your business down by saving nickels and dimes. I hired four of them. I've got one left. The other three I showed the door because they, could, they did not understand how to take care of people. Vendors. We have to make sure that we take care of our vendors. We have to make sure our vendors are profitable. How many businesses go out there and they try to beat up their vendors to get better pricing? Take care of your vendors. Be your vendor's best customer. Make sure that they're profitable. Watch what they will do to your business, the ideas that they have when they know that they're growing something with you. And communities. Two men in a truck, we have 347 locations in the U.S. alone. We are the big brother and the big sister when it comes to nonprofits in the communities. Those nonprofits need to be better. Our communities need to be better because we're there. When all these groups win, the byproduct is revenue. It comes in the end. It circles in and comes behind you. Our company has a lot of money. What I'm telling you is don't chase the revenue. So many people do that. How do we bring our faith into our office? Two men in a truck. Again, we're privately held. I get it. But we have the Ten Commandments in stone, and it's put in, in our brick building at the front door. If you show up early or late, there's a light on it so you can still see it. Those are rules of fair play in business. We have Bible study every week. 11.30 to 12.30 on Tuesdays. I have a black Southern Baptist that does it. He is one of my best friends, and he is loud. Wow, is he loud. I get people, and I leave the door open. Don't come in and tell me it's too loud. He knows the Bible more than anybody. And so I love that Bible study. We have prayer breakfast at our annual meeting held every year. We'll have about 500 people at our annual meeting. That prayer breakfast in a hotel, eggs, sausage, bad coffee, it's about $30,000 for one breakfast to last an hour. My family pays that. Why? Because we think God smiles and claps at that. I bet you half the people there are Catholic or, Catholic or Christian. The other half are just hungry. I don't care. As long as they're quiet, eat all you want. And I know that seeds are being dropped there. We pray before our picnics and our Christmas party at our corporate office. And once a week, myself, my CEO, John Nobis, my president, Randy Shaka, who also happened to be Catholic, and trust me, I didn't handpick that. I found out later. We pray over the business once a week. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I always prayed over the business, but I never prayed in front, in front of anybody, and it was awkward. But after about the second time we did it, we love it. I send devotionals most mornings to, our, to the employees at Wanham. Probably about half the employees are on there, and probably half of the half that take it, take it to suck up to me. I get it. <laughs> but that's okay. Maybe they read them. Um, but that's up to them. Not all of our employees are Christian. But I do know this. Even non-Christians love the environment when Jesus walks the halls. We do not push religion on anybody. But there's always a door open for people looking for a relationship with Christ. And people do walk through that door from time to time. In conclusion, we live in our Christian faith by making biblical decisions at work. I think the Lord smiles down on two men in a truck and has shown us mercy and patience when we get it wrong. I certainly feel his proddings when our company goes sideways. But I also feel his protection and his favor. I pray that you will all find adventure in this school year and that you will end up finding a place where you feel comfortable leaning on your faith in your professional life. Be courageous in your careers and live adventurously. God programmed, you, programmed that into you. And every day know that whatever you call your career, live your faith through it.
people should see your faith in what you do. Garbage collector, mover, surgeon, soldier. Wherever you end up, honor God. Thank you. I'm more than happy to answer any questions other than when I was a rugby player. You got one over here. Uh, can everyone hear me? My voice? Okay, perfect. Um, my question for you is regarding the future of the trucking industry. Uh, according to a recent LA Times article, they've estimated that 1.7 million truckers across this country are their job security is threatened by automation and especially automated vehicles. So how is your industry and business leaders like yourself and others across the country and even the world, how are they going to respond to this uh, some may call it a crisis, some may call it progress, or somewhere in between. That's a great question. That's called a disruptor. And no matter where you work or what your education is in, there's disruptors in those industries. And talking about living a courageous life is you can either make your money on those disruptors or you can lose it. We take a look at that as actually being a positive thing. Anything that can make our, uh, make our roads more safe, uh, we're all for that. Uh, we also know that, like everyone else, we're looking for employees in many different positions. Uh, movers are still needed uh, at, at this point, and that's going to take a while for that to happen. Um, but that does actually free up some human resources uh, to do some other things. Um, but I would take a look at that as more of a positive thing um, than, than, than a negative thing. One of the issues that we have to deal with with that is the fact that those automated uh, vehicles will kill people as well. Probably a lot less, but how do, how do we deal that uh, with, with humans when, when something like that happens? Even if they cut the death rate down, they cut it 80%, can we still deal with that? But that's a really good question. Right here. Uh, thank you, first off. Uh, my question is, how, how have you been able to successfully communicate your uh, mission and values to so many of the employees that y you do not see day to day? Well, using technology, I mean, we, we do have, um, we'll do uh, like, like Skype shows with our executives and we'll talk about those things. Um, we're very, very connected. Uh, two men in a truck, uh, we based, we have all of our computers are all tied to one platform. And so our franchises really aren't out on islands. So we know, and I'll get to your question here, but kind of filling it up a little bit, back filling it a bit. We know how many calls are coming in. We know what, what their closing rates are. Um, we know if franchises are having problems before they do. So to, to answer part of that, we're very well connected between all of us. We also have, um, We've got a, it's a closed site on Facebook called Accelerate. And Accelerate, and then we give uh, passes to all of our frontline uh, employees. And we have, like I said, in the middle of the summer, we had about 10,000. So they get on there and they, they post pictures of trucks that they have packed. They post stories of how they exceeded customer expectations. It is crazy when you have that many trucks on the road how many things that our movers run into. Our movers yearly pull people out of cars that are sinking in, in lakes, pull people out of cars that are on fire. They run into all the, the strangest kind of things, driving around, seeing fires, and so they, so all of a sudden it's like, it's, it's called a move hero, and, and all, this, all of this is shared on Accelerate. And when we see really good things where um, movers, drivers, CSRs go above and beyond, uh, we give a, a Move Hero uh, Award. And it's like, like a shirt, a hat. Uh, at, the, at our annual meeting, we have a Mover of the Year. And uh, our franchisees will send in 
like this is why this guy's mover of the year, and this is why this, this gal is, is CSR of the year. And remember, every mover, or every move that, that, that we go on, um, there's a reply card that's sent out. So we have movers that have been on four or 500 jobs and gotten all fives, meaning that they were perfect the whole year. They didn't have one single damage. Um, so the, that stuff is shared on Accelerate. And so pretty soon, what we want to get are these movers and drivers to look, look, I'm not just a lumper. I'm not just some guy on a truck. Um, there's some, some people that are doing some great things. And so another thing that I did, it was kind of interesting, is I wanted the movers and drivers to know this is not a dead-end job. Um, and we've been in business long enough, I got a hold of the marketing department, and I said, can you get, do your magic that you do on social media and find out what our movers and drivers and CSRs are doing 10 or 15 years down the road after they've been working with us? We had two that were rocket uh, NASA scientists. We had a Harlem Globetrotter. We had, oh, what's his name? He was a pitcher for the Atlanta Braves, Tim. Somebody help me out here. He's a Hall of Fame pitcher. Yeah. He worked for two men in a truck in Alabama. And we interviewed him and asked him, how did being a mover help you become so successful in baseball? He said, for, for one thing, when you're moving furniture all the time, you're, you're lifting things with your fingers and your wrists are so fatigued. He said, I had to throw curveballs after that. He goes, it made me tougher. But, on the, but he goes, I also had to show up at work every single morning in uniform. And he goes, all those things have, have led to, to my successes. And so we've got teachers and lawyers and, and police officers um, that have all start, started at Two Men in a Truck. And so we share, this, share these with the, with, with the movers. I tell the movers and the drivers that... You know, I said, raise your hand if your goal in life was to be a mover. It's like, wow, nobody. So when you were kids and you were like eight or nine years old and you were playing uh, cops and robbers and policemen and firemen, no one raised their hand and said, it's my turn to be the mover? It's shocking, you know. Me either, by the way. Um, but I tell them where opportunity lies, and I tell that to all of you as well. Opportunities are typically dressed in Carhartt coats and boots. They don't look like opportunities. I tell my movers that are sitting in front of me, I'm saying, you know what? I'm looking at you guys. None of you are starving to death. I'm sure you all slept with a roof over your head last night. I'm sure that you have a, a fresh running water, a flush toilet. I'm sure that you have somebody that loves you and you love somebody else. If that's the case, you've got it better than 95% of the people of the rest of the world. There are people literally dying to try to get into this country to have the opportunity to sit in your chairs. Don't ever hang your head and don't ever, ever make yourself a victim. And I, what I want is to open their eyes to realize that, you know, you have to take the opportunity that's in front of you and you have to make it happen. You can't blame your mom or your dad for the issues that you have, you know, you can't blame, you know, your parents don't owe you anything. Your grandma and grandpa don't owe you anything. Local, state, federal government owe you nothing. Two men in a truck doesn't owe you anything. God owes you nothing. You have to take what's in front of you and you have to make, make something happen. It really, everyone has their issues. You have to take advantage of the opportunities that are given to you. And what I try to do is just wake them up and let them realize that, man, look, at, look what's in front of you. And it's funny, I gave that talk. It was a lot, probably a lot darker, but <laughs> I gave it to a, franchise in Phil, to a franchise in Philadelphia, and I had some guys walk up to me, and they just went, I, I'm not even sure how to talk to you. And I went, just, I'm a human being, just talk to me, what? And he's, uh, he's like, I needed to hear that. I said, isn't it liberating? Isn't it liberating when nobody can keep you down? How many times do we see ourselves in a jail cell and we're shaking it because we want to change our lives? It's like, I got an idea. Why don't you push the bars open instead of keep pulling them towards you and walk out? And those are the types of talks I try to give my movers and drivers and customer service reps because I, I want them to realize that, man, you've got so much opportunity in this job.
and I talked to them about some of our franchisees that started just, just like they are. We have franchisees also that were attorneys, that were accountants. And you know what? They come into our franchisees, they got a lot to learn too. They have to learn how do you deal with customers, how do you deal with blue collar employees. And their learning curve is almost as disastrous as our movers who've never went to college that don't understand finance or marketing, but you can hire people to do those things. And so when they start realizing that, oh, you know, I'm not such a loser after all, it's like, no. Look in the window, or look in the mirror, and not out the window for excuses. And you have the opportunities here. God's blessed us with this country. Take advantage of them. How's that for a really long answer to your really short question? <laughs> Come on, a couple more. Father? Thank you very much. I um, often think about the difficulty of having to help people find another job. So you mentioned four people you hired and then you had to get rid of three of them. What was the process of doing that as a man of faith who cared about them, as children of God, oh, uh, and all that's involved in that? Great question. Um, actually, those were really easy, Father, <laughs> but I got one that wasn't. And uh, when I took over as, as president and CEO, um, I went over the org charts. We didn't really, they weren't very good. Job descriptions were horrible. Um, I grabbed about six people that I totally trusted in the business, and we just pounded this thing. I don't have enough time to talk about it. Now, this is something I prayed about. Lord, how do I find out who should stay and who should go? And it was an amazing answer that he gave me, but because we're short on time, there was one person that had been with our business for 20 years. And she made it on, on the first cut. And I'll tell you what, when I had to let people go, um, some of them I cried. And some of them I laid on the floor and cried in my office. It was horrible. And it was like, well, it's done. It's over. We had 78 employees. And I took it down to about 65. And it was a horrible day. And then I thought I was done with it. And it laid on my heart I was not done. And I went, what do you mean? And it's like, you've got Jane there. And it's like, Jane's been working with my mom when those kids were going to school. And it's like, I can't do that. And I really struggled with that. And I prayed over that. And what came to me was beautiful. It was like, Brig, I didn't literally hear the voice, because if I did, I'd have a problem, right? No, it's, this is like a little thing. It's like, let her go. I've got big plans for her, and she is using this business as a shelter. And you know what, Brig? There's a lot of great places to work other than two men in a truck. She will be fine, but I can't do anything with her until you let her go. And Father, that was the truth. And something else happened too, is she had been there for so long, she became like a big oak tree that spread her branches out and nothing would grow underneath her. And when we uprooted that tree, I had so much young talent that came up in spades. It was like little saplings all over the place with all new ideas that were coming in within a week. And I knew that it was a blessing. And Jane is fine now. And God was right. And so what we have to do is, I'll have to tell you another story that we'll get to that as well. Our Bible study had a room full. I went through all the things. Um, I had to downsize. It was very, very tough. It's like, oh my gosh, I need Bible study. You know, it's Tuesday. This is uh, many years ago. I sit down and there's, one young lady at the end of the table and me. And I'm like, where is everybody? She goes, you fired them all. I said, I wiped out our Bible study? And she goes, every one of them except for me. <laughs> I went, holy crap. It's like, all right, well, we'll meet next Tuesday. I have nothing to add to that. And I went into my office and I shut the door and I started cracking up, and it was like, not because these people were let go, don't, you're missing that. 
it's God blinded me to, I wasn't going to save all the Christians, you know. And it never dawned on me. When I saw all their names and all this, they were all scattered in different departments and different boards. I, it never dawned on me. I wiped it out. But I know that that's the way that God wanted it. And um, eventually, uh, yeah, we started a new Bible study. I think there were some people who were going like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> um, but that, that did happen. And it's, it's just another thing when you're my age and you look back on your business, you start seeing these little, these little fingerprints of God in the business. And that was one of those things that, that, that was really good. So when you do have to let somebody go, you, you have to really t take a look at it and, um, and, and figure it out and let them know. You know, you don't want to crush people. Um, some people are crushed no matter what. There's not much that you can do about that. But, but you have the responsibility as a leader to watch, your, watch that mission statement, watch the core values of the business. You are a lion watching for that. You protect that. And you don't care about the money part of that. That is something that can't, that has to be a rock. We let our number two franchise go uh, a few years ago. Nobody thought that we would do it. And I said, you know what? I'll pump gas before I give up any of the integrity of this company over money. That's not going to happen. But, good, but when he was gone, it was like, wow, yeah, that revenue is going to be missed. But also, I was getting phone calls from franchises going, well, what do he do? <laughs> he did not adhere to the, mission, or to, to the, the franchise agreement. Well, what was that? Well, I don't know. Read your franchise agreement. Um, and it was funny because all royalties started coming in really quick, and it was like, we got good hang time out of that. Um, but you make the decisions based on integrity and taking care of people. You pray over those decisions, and it's crazy. Some of the things, some of the answers that come back to you, the world of business would think you're a fool for doing what you did. And it's like, I don't, I don't go by those rules. I try not to. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, Brig. A little present, okay, as, as a sign of our affection. And students, next CO series, October 16, again here, another friend of mine. I really hope you enjoy. Thanks again, and God bless you all. Thank you.